So you know that I am presenting a paper written by me as a historian and by Daniela Patti, who is an archaeologist. And I also have to confirm that she's not here because of uh, serious familiar issues. So sorry for that. And sorry also for my English, which is, which is very Ita an Italian English. So um, secondly, uh, I, I wish to be clear about the fact that we decided in the end to address here a single case study, as you see from the title. We changed slightly the title of the paper. And this case study will be the one of the sanctuary of St. Matthew the Apostle, which is located at the borders of a village called San Marco in Lamis, on the promontory of Gargano in Apulia which is here, I don't know if you see my, um, my you know, so, something on the screen, but you see it's the, just the wheel of Italy. A third disclaimer, our take, our personal take on lived religiousness is different from the traditional approach of the French school of Annal, for example, and I'm thinking about the Histoire vécue du peuple chrétien, De Lumeau, you know, Jean de Lumeau, or Gabriele Bra. This sounds in Italian, vissuto cristiano. Uh, even if this approach has been of paramount importance in the past investigation on Apulian sanctuaries, specifically on the sanctuary of San Michael the Archangel in Monte Sant'Angelo, which is registered in the UNESCO World Heritage List, and many scholars of the University of Bari, including myself, have devoted many and many papers and much research on this sanctuary. So this is precisely the reason why, why, why uh, I am not speaking about this sanctuary here. Our approach to live the religiousness owes much more to Jörg Rupke's conceptualization of lived ancient religion which focuses not only on the micro-historical events, like the Lumeau approach, but on the different meanings attributed by individual and collective agents in different situations to their religious experiences and devotional expressions. And I am thinking precisely of spaces, places, practices, symbols. So after that, we can get started. You see here, the promontory of Gargano can be described as a holy mountain. It has, it has been indeed perceived as sacred since Roman and even pre-Roman times, as it, as it is witnessed by textual and archaeological sources. The sacredness of the mountain seems to be embodied in its landscape, a chain of sanctuaries hermitages, monasteries, rock settlements, burial places, strictly connected with and significantly empowered by a network of late antique and medieval pilgrimage routes, which are today officially branded as a branch of the Southern Via Francigena, which, as you know, starts in Canterbury. I read here, if we observe St. Matthew's convent from a distance, it looks like a solid and powerful building, well-structured, with its ancient foundations resting on the red rocks of the western slope of Mount Celano. However, looking closely, it shows all the troubles of its history, made of changes and accretions. This is how the Franciscan friar Mario Villani, former head of the library of St. Matthew's Sanctuary, describes the place where he has been living for more than 50 years. He draws a comparison between the architectural structure of the building, which is extremely complex and challenging to understand, to understand and the history mirrored in its configuration a resilient history of more than one religious institution, but also a many-sided history of shepherds, 
animals, peasants, pilgrims, relics, ex votos, which contributed to shape not only the building, but the entire space and the surrounding landscape. This is the reason why a multifaceted investigation on St. Matthew's Sanctuary has become one of the main objectives of the cross-disciplinary research carried out from year 2012 to year 2017 by a team of scholars involved in the National Italian Project. I, was, uh, I had the fortune to be the principal investigator of this project. And the title is Sacred Spaces and Identity Paths, Foundation Texts, Iconography, Cults and Traditions in Italian Christian Sanctuaries from Late Antiquity to Middle Ages. The project included four universities, Bari, and now in Sicily, which is Daniela Patti's university, she was responsible for the unit, unit research unit of Enna, Padua, and also Rome. So originally, St. Matthew's Sanctuary was a Benedictine yeah. abbey dedicated to St. John the Baptist, named San Giovanni de Lama. And as far as we know, the first mention of the existence of this place is to be found in a Byzantine document, a sigillum. It is a legal document issued in 2007 by Alexio Xifas, at that time Byzantine governor of Italy. This sigillum was intended both at confirming the possession of the abbey and providing it with more territorial assets. This could only mean that at the beginning of the 11th century, the place was already a powerful and active feudal institution. Therefore, it should have been founded well beforehand. St. John the Baptist, along with St. Michael the Archangel, was acknowledged as the patron of the Longobards. And such a piece of evidence, along with the important role exerted by this population in shaping the history of the sanctuary of St. Michael the Archangel, which is located 30 kilometers east from St. Matthew. So this evidence lead many scholars to hypothesize a Langobard foundation also for St. John's Abbey, perhaps around the eighth century. Thus, before becoming a powerful Benedictine institution, it could have been a temporary accommodation for the pilgrims headed precisely to St. Michael's sanctuary. This is the reason why the pilgrimage routes, which connected the main sanctuaries at Gargano, have been labeled by many scholars via Sacra Langobardorum. In spite of the fact that such a name is not recorded in the existing documentary sources. More correctly, this road network should be considered, as I said before, a branch of the southern Via Francigena. Moreover, I suggest that the dedication to St. John the Baptist doesn't need to be specifically connected with the Longobards. Such dedication could also be understood taking into account the particular physical environment of the Gargano. In fact, being the landscape wild and rocky, water sources have always been of the utmost importance for the local population and their cattle. This is confirmed by the Latin author Strabo, who in the Augustan age wrote about a small river in Gargano where people and animals, in particular sheep, were healed from their diseases. It is thus not surprising that the first Christian settlements in such a territory were dedicated to biblical characters somehow related to water. Like Michael the Archangel, who expressed his healing power by means of a water drop dripping in the cave in Gargano, and who is somehow linked with water also in his sanctuaries in Asia Minor, but most of all, St. John the Baptist, who is universally associated with the redeeming function of the weather. And also think of the fact that the name of the town where St. Pius, St. Pius tomb is located is San Giovanni Rotondo, because there was an ancient baptistry. 
down there. So uh, going back to the history, in the land under their control, the Benedictine monks fostered the cultivation of cereals, olive trees, vineyards, as well as the rising of cattle. They even started the light commerce with the Eastern Mediterranean countries, counting on pilgrims, merchants, and soldiers directed to Michael's sanctuary and eventually to the Holy Land. Documents show, however, the lack of any positive integration between the local population and the Benedictines, confirmed by the fact that the inhabitants used to make intrusions into the territories of the Abbey. This was due to their critical living condition, to their poverty. But in a broader sociological perspective, it demonstrates the extent to which the everyday life of these peasants and shepherds was disconnected from the religious and institutional life of the Abbey. Things changed radically when in the 16th century, the Abbey became a Franciscan convent. This happened after a long period of decline, started in the 13th century with the Emperor Frederick II. In 1578, Pope Gregory XIII entrusted the building to the Franciscans, who supported a global process of restoration, which gradually transformed not only the architecture of the building, but above all, its identity and its bonds with the landscape and the people. Soon after their arrival, although it is difficult to establish the precise moment when this happened, a precious wooden statue of St. Matthew the Apostle, possibly a former statue of Christ, was positioned in the church of the monastery. In the same period, a relic, acknowledged as St. Matthew's molar tooth, was transferred to the convent, probably from Salerno which is in Campania, and it is a town on the patronage of the Apostle. The powerful sacred presence of the relic led the faithful to search for a cure for themselves and their animals, especially for those affected by symptoms related to hydrophobia, so the bites of the dogs, but also bites of snakes, for example. Indeed, it is precisely from the time of the arrival of the Franciscans that this sacred place can truly be described as a sanctuary, even if such a label has never been formally approved from a Catholic official perspective, which is a very interesting issue, but I'm not, issue, but I'm not going to expand on it now. As for the archaeological research, and this is Daniela, According to the principles of the landscape archaeology, we globally investigated patterns of the sacralization on the Gargano promontory, exploring different typologies of sites, rock burials, hermitages, worship places, but also smaller settlements identified by the presence of pottery fragments. So you see here the surveys we made. There are all you know, uh, um, name of single little places we investigated. In particular, the surveys focused on the Valley of Stignano and on the identification of its settlements, especially the mouths of this valley, which leads to the branch of Via Francigena, who, uh, who goes from San Matthew Sanctuary to San Michael Sanctuary in Gargano. The majority of these settles are caves, as is typical in, Medi in the Mediterranean area. As such, they are difficult to date because they were continuously reused through centuries, changing their function over time. Houses, tombs, animal shelter, places of worship, etc. In conclusion, we focused our archaeological research with three campaigns of excavation and one of them international with students coming from Chicago, Loyola University, on a building which is in close topographic proximity with St. Matthew's Sanctuary, you see here, but in a higher position. The so-called Nicholas Hermitage. Hermitage is just a way it has been called because later on people went there just to have hermitage experiences. 
but it is absolutely not a hermitage indeed. In fact, it is a single apse worship building marked by longitudinal arches. And this is a widespread typology of buildings in this area, so Gargano and Molise in the medieval age, ages, uh, especially between 9th and 11th century. So the, the origin of this building tracks precisely between 9th and 11th centuries and is probably to be connected to small rural settlements in the area. We found traces of them. At a certain moment, it may have become a small xenodocium, a hospitium, a temporary accommodation, both for pilgrims and other kind of travelers. This transformation seems to be testified by three rooms added along the southeast side of the nave, built when the church was still in use. Moreover, in one of these rooms, we found clear tri traces of the steps of a staircase leading to an upper floor. There should have been also a small tower, so maybe a bell tower. We can hypothesize indeed that this place was somehow connected to the Benedictine Abbey of San John de Lama. Could it be its original settlement, given that it was located in a more defensible position than its current site? This is just a question. Alternatively, taking into account the history of other monastic settlements mentioned in the area by early medieval documental sources, we could also hypothesize that this place was connected to a different religious order, perhaps an antagonist order of the powerful Benedictine Abbey, as would testify also the Hagia toponym related to the Byzantine cult of St. Nicholas, which was widespread in Apulia well before the translation of his relics from Mira to Bari in 1087. So to answer such question, we still need to do more extensive research and not only historical and archeological, but archival as well. Unfortunately, this has not been possible within the framework of our project. The funding uh, was quite, uh, you know, uh, we didn't have a, a large amount of funding and we didn't have time. So uh, we really hope it will be possible within the framework of a larger national or even, or even international funded project in the near future. And for now we are done. So thank you for your attention.